Today we're going to talk about uh, fruit bearing trees, shrubs, and vines that you can use in your landscape to help um, um, address um, your desire to have some fruit to eat yourself, but also to support wildlife. Uh, this is the second in a series. Uh, we will also be doing upcoming programs on fruit tree and shrub maintenance, pruning, and other kinds of um, issues, uh, management of, of disease and insect issues. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I am an extension agent with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Um, extension is the outreach from the state land grant colleges, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. My program area is agriculture and natural resources, but we have a full office in the Arlington, um, Fair Arlington Community Center uh, that also adds um, two agriculture and natural resources programs on family consumer sciences, which consists of nutrition and financial education, and of course, 4-H youth leadership and development. I am privileged to work um, in this job now for 13 years or so. And one of the highlights of my job is working with two volunteer organizations, Master Gardeners Northern Virginia and the Arlington Regional Master Naturalist. I also do a lot of other things and I wanted to tell you about them because I don't think that everybody understands what Cooperative Extension does. Um, one of my jobs is to support the green industry in our areas. And so I do a lot of education along with my colleagues in Northern Virginia to help support best practices for commercial horticulture professionals. Uh, we also uh, work with volunteers to do public education, um, outreach in many, many different venues. And of course, the natural naturalists are also engaged extensively with natural resource management, uh, monitoring, invasive removal efforts, and so on. But there's lots of other projects that both groups are involved in. One of them is Audubon at Home, um, which is a site visit program that sends people to uh, volunteers to for homes um, to address um, questions about how folks can make the um, properties more inviting to birds and butterflies and, and other native insects. Um, we have a Victory Gardens project, which is working with the Friends of Urban Agriculture to promote food production for local food banks. And this is a wonderful new project, um, which is, um, has a goal of producing 2,500 pounds of food, um, growing food on school gardens that are obviously not being used right now. We also have a seed distribution project. And on the Master Gardens in Northern Virginia website, there is a form that you can request free seeds for your vegetable garden uh, that is, um, uh, that, that you can arrange to pick up, to put to use it in your, in your food growing efforts. And of course, the master gardeners have got five demonstration gardens throughout Arlington and Alexandria. The plant clinics sadly are closed that we normally operate at uh, farmers markets and special events. But as Leslie said, the horticulture help desk, the master gardener extension, master gardener help desk is still open. I want to tell you a little bit more. Um, Fair Island Community Center is still closed, uh, but we do have the help desk operating by, by uh, email. And the email is located there in the third line. This is mgrl for Arlington, Alex for Alexandria at gmail.com. And we are doing a lot of advice for folks on household and garden disease, um, insect ID and management, uh, plant selection, pesticide selection and management, soil testing. Uh, soil fertility management, and much, much, much more. Um, in a normal um, existence, we would have our little bit of a lab open at the Farrington Community Center where people can drop off plant samples. At some point in time, we will be able to take plant samples again, but that service is not now available. We do encourage you, and you will hear me say this again in the presentation, that soil testing is the foundation for good um, garden management and landscape management, and we do encourage everybody to use a soil test before adding anything to the soil in the way of fertilizer. So today's presentation, uh, I want to give you a little bit of an outline. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why we are focusing on native plants today. We are not particularly focused today on edible landscapes, although there is a section at the end of this presentation about how to integrate some of these plants into the landscape. Um, I'm specifically talking about 
and limiting this presentation to woody plants and vines. Um, so we're not going to talk a lot about um, herbaceous ornamentals um, or edibles that you might, which there are abundant um, examples of. We'll talk about trees and after the trees section, we will take some questions um, and then we have some shrubs and we'll take some questions after that. We have a vine section, a very small vine section that I'd like to tell you about that we will also take questions after. And of course, at the very end of this time, we will have um, more time for questions. We will also um, pass along any questions that don't get answered at the end of the presentation to our help desk and you will hear from us, okay? So let's go on. I want to tell you about this picture right here and um, to start out by saying, well, why native? Um, we have a choice in our management of our landscapes uh, in our communities. And we can choose to a, a wide array of plants that do extremely well here. And we are engaged in the process of promoting the selection and the choice of native plants, primarily because it supports our native birds and insects. Um, this particular picture is of a cedar waxwing that's eating service berries. And service berries are a workhorse of our, both our edible plant um, selection list as well as our ornamental plant selection list. So let's get started. Again, why are we choosing natives? Um, we are choosing natives because they provide food and habitat. They improve um, our ornamental appreciation of our landscape to support bioregional diversity and preservation efforts. And of course, because they are adapted to local environmental conditions and pathogens, they often have fewer um, pest problems and they often have fewer issues with um, the variations in our water cycle and our heat cycle and so on. Although we're seeing some changes and that's a whole nother discussion about um, native plant um, migration into our area. Uh, I want to just say that we see many fewer problems um, with, um, with, with drought, um, with flooding, with uh, insect problems, with disease problems on plants, on native plants. I want to also bring up the terms cultivar to you, cultivar or nativar, okay? And um, what do we mean by native plant versus a cultivar versus non-native? I think most of us will understand very easily the difference between a native plant and a non-native plant. Um, we do have many, many non-native plants that are used here in our everyday landscape. But our native plants, by my definition, are plants that were here when uh, European settlers first arrived. Uh, these plants have been, uh, in some cases, were cultivated for many, many um, hundreds and hundreds of years by Native Americans. Um, some of them were, were, were have been spread uh, throughout the country, but they were here when European settlers arrived. A, a native oil is a, um, a selection of a native plant that has been selected through modern breeding efforts, um, um, hybridization processes, or simply um, selection of a sport that occurs in propagation efforts for its superior or unusual characteristics. Let's look at that. Here we have an example of American persimmon. This is um, a wonderful native plant that thrives in our bottomlands. Um, people have chosen to, plant breeders for many years have chosen to select improvements for this plant. And one, one such selection or improvement is a, is a cultivar, a nat native eye, if you will, called meta. And uh, Diospyros virginiana meta is a selection of, a, of the Native American persimmon, which has been selected because of its superior fruit size. There may be other qualities too, but when you compare it to the non-native Asian persimmon, you can see that there is a, a, a difference in size, shape, color, and so on. Choose the native. We have many native eyes that are um, improvements over the straight species, genus and species that will give you a, um, sometimes a superior fruit or superior disease or insect resistance. Now, there is 
quite a bit of research that supports the fact that our native insects and birds that are supported by the straight genus and species are not as well supported by the nativars like meter, for instance, or meta. And they are certainly not supported as well by the non-native Asian persimmons in this case. So it's something to think about when you're making a choice. And we can make those choices, okay? I'd like to start out with this um, discussion to talk about trees and some of the native trees that we have at our disposal for use in our landscape that produce an edible fruit include walnuts, the American hazelnut, Allegheny chinkapin, and of course hickories. And I want to preface my additional comments by saying that this is the selections in this presentation are by no means intended to convey a complete or exclusive list. There are many other um, trees that are not, and plants that are not included in this presentation that may also provide um, an edible fruit for people as well as birds and animals. But today we're focused on those plants that give the most bang for the buck. And this presentation here starts out with black walnut. Um, the black walnut, the Juglans family, um, you know, the, the fruit for the black walnut is the first picture on the upper right. And it has a round fruit. And some of you are familiar with this fruit. It is a, um, um, a, a husk that surrounds a nut on the inside. And the Juglans family also includes butternuts or white walnuts. The black walnut is not, um, not as common here as it is when you get further west or into the Midwest, into the further north, um, but it will grow here and it does do very well. The butternut sadly is a wonderful nut. Uh, it is not pictured on this particular page, but it will be in a moment. And uh, it is under a great deal of, of, um, of um, disease pressure. Uh, so we don't see that as much. American hazelnut. Uh, is pictured on the bottom right corner. Um, and the Allegheny chinkapin, which is a, a relative of the American chestnut, um, is down, the nut is in the middle, as well as the hickories. The numbers that are in these um, uh, lines denote the number of approximate numbers of pollinators and insects that are supported by these particular families of plants. They are not intended to um, neglect the fact that many of these plants also provide food for wildlife. But this is just a kind of a snapshot of how valuable these plants are to our native pollinators. So black walnut um, is, again, the picture on the upper right is of black walnut. Um, it shows the husk as well as the nut on the inside. Um, this is uh, a large tree. It'll reach 75 to 100 feet. And if you wish to use this, you should be aware that there is um, um, some research that supports the idea that the juglones, the juglone species, are, um, uh, are, do not support and actually inhibit the growth of other plants underneath it. Not all plants are, are affected by this, but the, um, the, the uh, um, hormone called juglone, which is emitted into the soil, which serves as a um, uh, a plant inhibitor, a growth inhibitor um, to many plants. So be aware and find that list if you are interested in growing a black walnut in your landscape. The white walnut, um, again, it's a large tree, 65 to 120 feet. It is not as common here because it is subject to a variety of diseases. Um, bunch disease, which is um, a kind of a viral-like disease, which is spread by a mycoplasma, uh, fungal diseases and of course canker have um, significantly reduced the native population of this tree across the um, across our, our, our area. There is a plant called broadnut, um, which is a, a butternut, which is crossed with a Japanese walnut, which shows some resistance to the, many of these diseases, uh, which is available um, and will do well here if we wish to try to grow the butternut. The butternut is slightly different looking from the walnut, and you can see it has a more elongated um, um, fruit, which again is consists of a green husk on the outside 
and a nut on the inside, again, which is more elongated than the round walnut. Both of these are very long-lived trees, um, and um, having grown up in the Midwest, I'm well familiar with the harvest of these nuts. We used to gather them up, and when they fall off the tree, they still have these husks around them, and we would put these um, nuts in a gravel driveway and drive over them repeatedly, rake them up, drive over them, and the process of being ground against the, <laughs> against the um, gravel would eventually work, and actually very quickly would work the rotting husk off of the shell. And if you got through the nuts before the squirrels did, you could actually have a couple of bags full of nuts that we would then spend the winter time cracking open inside on, in front of the fireplace. Both of them like moist, well-drained soils and, um, and full sun. They would not do well in the shade at all. It's a great tree. It does, it does drop the nuts. And so you will want to use this tree in a place where, they, where you won't be bothered by the nuts falling. Hazelnut uh, is, an, is more of a shrubby tree. It's going to, going to be about nine to 12 feet tall. It is an understory tree. It is a tree that likes to have moist soil, um, certainly at least partial shade. Um, it will need to um, um, be allowed to have um, fairly moist soil that is, doesn't dry out badly underneath trees. And it is self-fertile, which means it produces both the male and the female flowers on the same plant. And the picture in the middle is of the male catkins hanging down and it's a very interesting, beautiful um, effect in the wintertime. The tree does have some insect problems, and, but it will produce a, um, a viable crop for you here. Do also, uh, I think everybody would benefit, for those of you who have grown any of these plants, uh, if you'd like to share your experience in the chat box, I'm sure that everybody would enjoy seeing those. The alligator chinkapin um, is a shrub that I find very attractive. Um, it's, it's a shrubby small tree. Again, like the hazelnut, it's going to be 6 to 15 feet or so. It likes to be in partial shade. It does bottomlands. Um, it's going to want fairly rich, well-drained organic soil. And it does really well at a wood's edge as a specimen or a border plant. Now, I want you to have a look at that nut because it is related to the American chestnut. Castanea. This is Castanea pumilla, uh, Allegheny chinkapin, and Castanea dentata, which is the American chestnut. We um, are not likely to see this kind of a tree ever again in our lifetimes, but research continues at various centers from uh, across the um, 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 the, this, the uh, mountains down from Georgia up to up to Pennsylvania on research projects that involve crossing uh, the American chestnut, which is subject to the blight, which killed most of them in the early 1900s, um, crossing the American chestnut back to Chinese chestnut, which is resistant to the blight. Um, this was a very important tree, both to the lumber industry as well as to wildlife support. Uh, and, and of course, it's, it supported a great many people uh, who gathered up the nuts and ate them as well. But these trees were truly magnificent. If you've never seen pictures of the Chinese, of the American chestnut, uh, do um, have, have, a, have a look for some because they are truly magnificent, amazing trees. Um, but it's hard to believe that we ever had trees that large. The hickories are the um, next group of trees that um, are very valuable nut trees. Um, the shell bark hickory is generally considered to be have the sweetest uh, nuts. It is a self-fertile tree. It doesn't require two, uh, you know, different trees to produce nuts. The shagbark hickory is pictured at the lower right, and it has a very unique trunk and a uh, beautiful tree in the forest. And you will often find these, both of these trees growing um, in mixed woods, deciduous woods settings. Having said that, they do prefer sun and they will often be found at the edges of woods where they appreciate both the shade of the trees adjoining their, their planting area as well as the full sun for um, flowering and fruiting. 
These are large trees, and I also should tell you all that with all of these nut trees, it often takes many years for them to become fruitful. So you can wait for multiple years before you can actually have a fruit crop. So this is not for the uh, impatient. Have some patience and um, allow it to develop, and you will reap some really nice rewards. I also spent my childhood picking up hickory nuts, and these hickory nuts uh, have a very tough, uh, once you get the, the, um, the um, outer um, husk off, um, the, there was a very thick inner husk, which has to be broken open. And the favored mode of attack was a hammer and a concrete block, which we would use and sit and tap it just right, not to smash the nut completely, but to crack it open and um, be able to get to pry the nut meat out. But this is wonderful eating. We also have a pecan tree which can be grown here. And the pecan tree, um, Caria illinoisensis, is a member of the same family as the hickories. And if you want to have nut production, the general advice is you need to have two and even better three different cultivars planted. This can be done by planting multiple trees or you can simply graft on to a branch of one tree selections of the other cultivars. We can talk more about grafting and we will at the end of this presentation, but it's really another presentation. But if you have room for it, the pecan is a gorgeous tree. It's a lovely shade tree. And uh, it's, a, it's a tree that is becoming um, more reliable. It often the, the nut crop is often killed by a late frost. And so um, as we get warmer temperatures in our climate, we might be able to grow better pecans. Before we go on to um, uh, this, I want to also say that um, the flowers also of these trees often provide a food source. This is, we did not include those um, because we were focused on fruit today. But this picture in this slide is of redbud. Uh, so it's just canadensis, which is a lovely native tree in our landscape. Um, the flowers are edible. And this particular plant is a lovely uh, member of the pea family, which supports a great many pollinators and butterflies. So if you have room for a tree, but you don't want the mess of a, of a fruiting tree, you might consider, um, obviously this does produce a fruit as well. It looks like a, an obvious member of the pea family when you see the, the, the seed pod. But uh, if you don't want the mess of a, a large crop of fruit to clean up, and many people don't, um, you can still plant plants that attract pollinators and support them by thinking about what kinds of flowers you need to add to your landscape. So this section includes um, some small trees. Uh, and again, most of these have very strong, um, provide very strong support to our native pollinators and um, the crab apples, American persimmons, service berries, red mulberry. These are, uh, in addition to the pawpaw, are going to be what we're going to talk about today. Okay, native crab apple. Um, this is, um, has a little asterisk for it in my mind. I love crab, crab apples. And I often pick them to make jelly in the fall. Um, the pictures are of Malus coronaria on the left and Malus angustifolia on the right with the um, yellow, um, yellow fruit. This is the southern crab apple. And the problems with the crab apples are that they pr are prone to two diseases, one called scab and one called rust. And this is, um, a, a disease, these are diseases that often result in the defoliation of the entire tree by midsummer. One way to get around this is to go to the cultivars, the nativars, if you will. If you can find a nativar that has been bred for disease resistance, they do exist, okay? So if you like crab apple and they're gorgeous trees, um, they're, they're, they're relatively small size, very suitable for, for a small urban landscape, uh, and the fruits, um, again, the native ours have often been selected for larger fruit sizes or even forms. I have seen um, native ours, um, cultivars of crab apple that have fastidiate forms or they're very narrow or they're vase shaped. And 
these there's even dwarf forms that are available to you. So if you must go with a native eye for either size or food production, um, this is a, this is there's lots of choices for you available in the crab apple group. But this is a, a fabulous um, plant for supporting native bees, bumblebees, honeybees. This is an early food source, a nectar source for them, and uh, it provides valuable food crop for the butterflies that feed on fruit, um, as well as wild animals that, that depend heavily on uh, fruit drop. Nice tree to 20 feet, 20 by 20 or so. And again, there are many different um, prestigiate or dwarf forms that are available. There's even weeping crab apples, okay? So if you can find a, a native eye which suits the size of your landscape, um, which is also disease resistance, this is one particular tree which I would um, strongly encourage selection of a disease resistant native eye. Let's talk about red mulberry. Um, this is a, um, uh, a native tree that has, will grow to about 30 feet. Uh, it is an understory or woods edge type of tree in its native location that favors areas that have moist, well-drained soil. There are many, many cultivars available to you um, that will improve the performance of this plant. In the wild, this tree has um, hybridized with the white mulberry, um, which is not native. And it is almost impossible to find uh, red mulberry growing wild. Um, because of this tendency to hybridize and produce um, crosses between red and white mulberry that are growing wild. It is, um, uh, uh, does support several different kinds of butterflies. There's a picture of a morning cloak down here. I love butterflies, so I had to put some pictures in that, 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 that these um, that appeal to these plants. The fruit is um, um, highly sought after. Um, and when they come ripe, they are, the birds are all over this plant, uh, eating the berries and dropping their messes <laughs> behind them. And uh, if you do not want um, to experience the, um, the effects of birds feasting on your trees, you're going to have to not plant this near your driveway or your cars or your picnic tables or your um, play areas, okay? So, um, this is a wonderful tree to put back in the back corner of your landscape to attract birds and pollinators. Let's talk about pawpaws for a second. This is a Simina triloba. Um, there are many common names for this. The one I learned first was Indiana banana. Uh, the fruit, which is pictured there in the middle picture at the bottom, uh, is a large um, fleshy fruit, which is ripe after it starts to a soften and, um, and that it almost starts to, to rot before it's really, really good. Um, but Indiana banana, the taste of it, the name comes from the taste of it, which is some people liken to a cross between pineapple and banana with some sort of spicy flavors mixed in. But I like it. You will find it uh, locally in bottomlands near the Potomac River. I've seen it down on Turkey Run. Uh, they do have a group of these trees growing at the um, demonstration garden at Simpson Park in Alexandria that the master gardeners maintain. There are lots and lots of cultivars of this plant, but most of them get to about 18 feet. Uh, and they all like to have an understory or almost slightly shady location. They will grow in full sun, but they're not going to be as happy as they are where they get some moisture and when they get a little bit of shade. You can use it for naturalizing. Uh, then they, I have seen them, again, I have seen them used as, as lawn trees almost, you know, what I call lawn trees, um, out in the open as uh, ornamental specimens. But again, this is gonna be much happier in a more native um, situation. If you want to have good fruit production, you're going to have to have not just two different trees, you're gonna have to have two different trees from different genetic strains. In other words, you're gonna to have to get one from one location, you have to get one from another location, okay? That is going to be 
um, from different genetic um, DNA, okay, for each type of plant. I don't know how that works. I'm not a geneticist, but I can tell you that this is true. This is, you will not get very good fruit production until you have different um, plants planted together. Wonderful fall color, very interesting flower, great attracting for, attracting, attracting for zebra swallowtail, and um, you won't regret planting this tree. It's a, it's a gorgeous tree. The fruit is very edible, and you can see it's about this little foot in the palm of your hand. The Amelanchia species of service berries, um, there's three um, different species that will grow here. Amelanchia arborea, which is the smallest of them, um, is, um, in the, is, 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 um, sorry, is a more of a shrubby type of effect in the landscape. Amelanchia canadensis um, and Amelanchia grandiflora are both larger trees that are very showy in the landscape. This is a four season tree. It's beautiful in the spring, it's beautiful in the summer, it's beautiful in the fall with the fabulous fall color. And it has really cool gray um, branches and trunks for the wintertime interest. It's good as an accent, it can be used in a hedge or a border. Either way, this is a plant that you should include in your landscape. And again, this is a plant with a little asterisk talking point on it because all of these um, service barriers are subject to a disease called rust. And the rust will not kill the tree, but it does put blemishes on the leaves. Sometimes in its more severe forms, it will de distort the growth of the twiggy ends of the branches. But most importantly and sadly, it colonizes the fruit, this disease does. And you can harvest the fruit before the disease becomes bad, but the fungal disease will attack the fruit and turn it into a furry ball of orange mycelia. And once that happens, you won't want to eat it, and the birds won't want to eat it either. So harvest it, you know, just as it begins to turn ripe, and you will, try, you will um, be able to, off most years, be able to um, avoid this disease. This is disease has an alternate host, um, which is a cedar tree. And uh, the cedar tree is a native eastern red cedar, is ubiquitous in our landscape. Uh, it's not practical to try to remove all the cedar trees uh, from our landscape. And so this is a disease that if you are serious about doing food production, you wish to avoid the fungal disease, you're going to have to spray this on a preventative basis. Sadly, I have not seen any breeding programs that have resulted in a rust-resistant uh, service berry. Uh, so I'm not sure what the pro prognosis is, but I can tell you that it is still a beautiful plant and it still deserves a place in your landscape because this is a gorgeous, gorgeous plant that attracts many, many different kinds of butterflies. American persimmon is our uh, next one, and we're going to stop after the tree section here to talk to take questions. Um, this is a, a tree that is highly variable as far as size, 30 to 80 feet in the landscape. Amazingly beautiful fall color, um, gorgeous orangey, yellow, amber colors that, that um, persist into the wintertime. Uh, we have male and female flowers on this tree, but they are self-fertile. Anytime you have um, this kind, of, anytime you have a fruit tree, you're going to double your chances of having a better crop by planting more than one. So if you can find a way to give your neighbors one of these also, you have a better fruit crop too. The fruit is highly, on most varieties, is highly astringent. And that means that it has a high level of tannins um, and antioxidants, which are very good for you, but they also taste very bad until the fruit is very ripe. The, the process called blooding breaks some of those um, tannins down and makes the, um, the fruit more palatable. Sometimes that requires um, simply an aging process. Sometimes it requires frost, but that is considered to be um, a kind of a myth. It's, but it is true that after frost, they are definitely gonna be ripening fast. Uh, the, there are varieties, many cultivars of American persimmon available, some of which are uh, 
that don't require, the fruit doesn't require bladding. They are um, easily consumed even when they have not gone through this process. Uh, so you know, look for those. They are very tolerant of a wide variety of soils, um, but generally true, like most plants, they prefer not to stay, have their feet standing in water. And they make either a great specimen plant or a mixed uh, a border and a border. It is one of the, um, if not the only um, food source for lunar moths, caterpillars, and I, which I think are just very cool. So persimmon is a great place, great, definitely has a place in the landscape. So I'll try to include that. Okay. Um, I'm gonna stop here and ask for questions, Leslie. Yep, we got several here. All right, um, so somebody had asked early in the presentation if Clethra, Alifolia, and Viburnum, Acerifolium Acer are considered native by your definition. Um, again, I'm, I'm gonna stick by the definition. You know, for instance, um, peaches. Offer, I often get asked that question about peaches and peaches were established here in 1500s, but they were brought here by Europeans. And um, the Native Americans then shared them broadly and they have naturalized throughout the native range. But um, uh, the answer to your question is, I don't know those particular plants well enough to answer the question, but I'm glad to do some research. Okay, or they could send it to the help desk for us. Yes. Okay, um, somebody has 30 to 40 foot tall hickories. Should they have nuts on them by now? Should they have nuts on them by now? Um, I would have guessed they would have nuts on them by now. And um, if <laughs> some of one, a few of the hickories have very, very small, um, um, nuts that kind of go unnoticed. So if this is, a, you know, if you know what kind of hickory it is, that would be helpful. Um, the squirrels also do a number on the fruit as well. Uh, and other wildlife also quickly steal them away if you have them. But um, yes, I don't know. Um, You'd expect by that size that they should be fruiting. I would have thought so, yes. Okay. Um, how do you rate the Bart nut tree for value to wildlife? Well, they are a hybrid, and they are a hybrid of um, uh, with with a, with an Asian um, variety of, of 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 you know butternut with the butternut, and um, as a hybrid, as a cross between an Asian variety, they are not going to have the same value to wildlife and or uh, pollinators as the natives will. Okay. Um, what can be done to treat crab apple trees diseases once they occur? Ah, uh, once they occur, you're you're limited. You're very limited um, to what you can do, and the best thing you can do is to maintain the health of the tree, um, and that would include things like making sure that it gets that one inch of water per week making sure that the soil um, acidity is correct. And the, tree tip, the trees typically will um, leaf out again the following year. Um, and they are not um, necessarily adversely affected by repeated um, defoliation on an annual basis. But there's not much you can do if you already have the disease and uh, except to replace the tree with a tree that is resistant. Okay. Um, does the pawpaw colonize? Are they generally colorful and can they grow in Baltimore? They absolutely will grow in Baltimore and they will colonize. They, they spread by, um, by means of root suckers and produce more, more upright growth in a, in a, in a, um, a thicket type of planting. And that's often how you see them in the wild. They will um, be a cluster of of pawpaws growing together. Okay. Um, somebody has one pawpaw in their yard in Arlington. Do they need to add a second tree or is there enough in the general area of Arlington that you think it might still make fruit? Is it producing fruit now? They did not say, but I'm guessing no. I think that it's <laughs> recently planted. Okay. Um, 
again, you're going to need to have two separate genetic strains of them. Whether there's one close enough, I don't know what the distance is um, for adequate pollination, um, but I do know that if they're grown in proximity, they would do much better. Okay. Um, are any of these trees particularly resistant to deer? Ah, well, one of the reasons we plant um, these things is to produce food for wildlife. So, um, no, I don't believe that they are particularly <laughs> resistant. Okay, um, and somebody wanted you just to confirm, they, um, they have recently planted serv two service berry trees in their yard, and they have an eastern cedar on the other side of the house. Is that going to cause the rust issue? Absolutely, yes. I believe the distance must be greater than 200 yards to be able to be, provide any kind of protection. And, um, you know, if you, you can still have both those trees, but if you want to avoid the manifestation of rust on the service bear, you're going to have to do preventative fungicidal sprays. Okay. Um, somebody has they haven't say I'm sorry. Somebody says they have an apple service berry that has not shown signs of rust yet. Um, what is the best or least harmful antifungal, and when and how should it be applied? What is the most least harmful what? Um, antifungal spray. Oh, I, I I can't I can't help you out with that. We we recommend the fungal sprays that are uh, promoted in the. Uh, home Grounds and Animals Pest Management Guide for Homeowners, and that is a link that is in the, um, the handout um, for the resources, and the, we can put the link, maybe you can put the link in the chat box as well um, for the Home Grounds and Animals Pest Management Guide. And they, and there can, is a, they can also um, send that question through the help desk because the help desk could help them um, find the proper information from the pest management guide. Right. There are some products that are, are, are useful, but again, it's not very practical. You know, we're talking about spraying a tree and um, the most of the equipment that is available to us, um, you know, to, to treat a, a tree is not powerful enough to be, have a very big reach. And there is no such thing as a systemic fungicide. Um, okay, does service berry require sun? Does it require sun? It will appreciate sun, but it will also appreciate having parts, part shade. And it will still fruit if it gets part shade. Um, the, um, it likes, a, it likes a, um, uh, a setting where particularly it's sheltered from the, from the afternoon sun. For instance, the ideal setting would be something where it gets morning sun and then is sheltered from the afternoon sun. Okay, um, we have a qu couple questions about, um, can I give pawpaw plant from the runner to somebody else to grow? Is that an effective way to um, share them? Absolutely. What you can do is you can, this time of year, you can go out and you can do what's called root pruning. Take a shovel and cut through the roots, allow them to stay there and come winter time, dig up those um, pieces that you have pruned away from the parent plant pop them up and you have a new tree. Okay, um, and we have a question about blueberries, but I'm gonna let you get through the, um, the, the shrub section. I'll hold that for, for later. Okay, all, all right. right. All right, so we're gonna start with some shrubs now and I'm gonna um, run through these. I'm gonna go on to the next section here. This picture here on the bottom right is of a low bush blueberry, okay? Um, which we have not gone into great detail on, but we've got American plums. Um, the blueberry family, they are both huge supporters of pollinators and, and other butterflies that use their food or their flowers. Elderberry and box huckleberry um, are two fun plants to use in the landscape. Currants and chokeberries, all of them have wonderful fruit that we can tap into by planting them on our landscape. American plum is, a, is, is actually a small tree almost. It's, it's, um, it can be up to 10 to 20 feet tall if it's pruned in that way. Um, as a shrub, it's gonna provide a more of a thicker type of, of, of planting, which will grow to about eight feet. It suckers, it sends out new shoots underneath the ground and provides um, an ever growing um, patch of growth. You can prune that into a tree form by simply selecting out 
removing all the suckers and selecting one strong stem and allowing it to do its thing. We do have a young American plum planted at the uh, back of the Farrington Community Center in what we call the teaching garden adjacent to the loading dock at the back of the building. And it is a, um, a rapidly growing, almost horizontal shrub right now. So it's very interesting to watch it develop. It is also growing in practically full shade. Very interesting. This is a plant that likes to have the woods edge. Um, it will um, grow on the edge of woods where it gets shade and partial shade and cool temperatures. And um, it is very cool plant to use to naturalize areas that are on the edges of between meadows and woodland areas. Um, but if you want to maximize your fruit production, you're going to have to train it up into more of a, a, a tree form. Great plant, we need to use more of it. Wonderful, wonderful flowers. That are, the shrub is covered with flowers when it's blooming. And um, it's a great plant to use. The fruit's a small fruit, um, but it's, it's um, well worth having in your landscape. Highbush blueberry, this is an, another understory plant. It's um, natural habitat is on, in the understory of deciduous woods, but it does like acid soils and it does like moisture. You will see it sometimes in the um, in drier soils, but it will not produce abundant fruit crop unless it has sufficient water to do so. Um, it'll get six to 12 feet or so, um, and usually I see it more like four to eight feet at the most. Um, it has wonderful fall color, and it can be used as a foundation plant around homes as a shrub or as a specimen as part of a border uh, with other plants. The biggest thing about this plant to remember is if you want blueberries, and this is a very popular plant to grow for blueberries, okay, um, you're going to have to plant it in acid soil. You're going to have to maintain a highly acid soil. Most of our plants thrive between a pH level of 6.5 to 6.8 or 6. Point, or maybe even up to neutral. This is a plant that wants 4.5 to 5.5 pH, okay? It is almost impossible to maintain that level of, of soil acidity in an open garden type of landscape. So often the advice for those of you who want blueberries is to grow them in some kind of container. Gives you lots and lots of, of flexibility about where to grow it and where to hold it but it also means that you have to water a lot more often, okay? Soil pH is gonna be key to producing a fruit crop here. The box huckleberry um, is, is um, uh, Gay Luzasia brachycera, is a spreading uh, member, relative of the blueberry. Um, it is a very interesting plant, and I include it here, not because of its superior fruit production, because it, but it does have good edible fruit, but because of its growing habit. And for our small landscapes, this is something that might be fun to try. Six to 12 inches in height, up to maybe about two and a half feet at the most, is going to be what this plant does. And it, it tends to spread into great um, patches uh, in a natural setting. But again, it wants that acid soil. It's want to have moist, um, organic, loose soil. It's not gonna like our clay soil. Uh, so if you have that, you're gonna have to try to, to amend that. Um, you can see the resemblance to blueberries from the flowers um, in the upper right picture, as well as the fruit in the lower right picture. But the growth form, this is a great plant for a rock garden or some kind of a, um, a, an area where you can top dress the soil every year with something that will um, acidify the soil and provide you with not only um, a beautiful, interesting plant that gets its name from the size of the leaf, which looks a lot like boxwood. Okay. The black huckleberry and dangleberry are also um, can be grown here in our native. Um, they are, you know, again, these are going to be shade loving trees that, shade loving shrubs um, that will produce um, an interesting um, berry blueberry like fruit. Okay, let's talk about elderberry. If you want to have elderberry, you're going to have to have some space for this. This is a, a large shrub, 9 to 12 feet. 
it's going to prefer moist, again, moist to wet soils that are slightly acid. This can be grown as a hedge. This can be grown as a shrub border. It's effective for erosion control. And not only are the fruits edible, but the flowers are in high demand as uh, for making all kinds of different things. This is um, um, a plant that is often mistaken for other kinds of plants. And some of you will remember a few years ago when we had in Virginia here um, a scare with a plant called giant hogweed. This was the number one mistaken identity plant that I was called to identify um, during that summer. Beautiful plant, put it at the back of your border, put it at the back of your property, put it in a wet place that never gets dried out. It'll be so happy there and it will pay off every year with abundant fruit and flowers. You will need, however, to net the flowers, if you, not the flowers, you will have to net the fruit if you wish to keep it because the birds are all over this and they will not leave you any of it if you don't cover it up and net it somehow. Black currant um, and its cousin gooseberry um, are, are Virginia natives that were once banned here from being used. Um, they were banned in Virginia because they are the alternate host for the white pine blister rust. And white pine at one time was a major um, forest crop, a uh, lumber crop in Virginia. And this plant was an alternate host that caused a disease in the pine trees as well, or aided and abetted a disease in the pine trees as well. Um, that band has been removed and you can easily grow currants here. They get two to four feet tall, fabulous fall color, very cool looking flowers, and um, a fruit that is um, um, very adaptable to many different kinds of uses. You can make a juice out of it, you can make pies out of it, um, wonderful in bake, any kind of baking and um, it, it will fit into your spaces, okay? It's only two to, two to four feet. It does, it is another plant that requires and prefers full sun and a low pH. Um, this is well within the range of the 6.5 to 6.8. Um, so it won't be as hard to grow as blueberries, but again, if you give it a little bit more acid than that and take it down to 6.0 6 or so, it'll be much happier at that level. Okay, let's talk about aronia. Um, aronia, um, there's two varieties of aronia that we can grow here, which are beautifully native and perform very, very well in the landscape. They are very tough. They tolerate very poor soil. This is one that definitely deserves space. It spreads by suckers, and if you don't, which, which is good and bad, um, it'll cover an area if you wish it to. The fruit is very beneficial at high levels of really good stuff to eat. The birds love it too. And interestingly enough, it's often one of the least, one of the last um, uh, fruits to be left in the landscape. And so it provides a, a wintertime meal for migrating birds. Two of them, one of them is Aronia melanocarpa. Um, Again, look at the names, Viking, Nero, Groundhog, Lowscape Mound. These are nativars, cultivars of this particular um, genus and species, okay? They get three to five feet tall, black fruit, fabulous fall color, once full sun. Its um, sister plant is Aronia abutifolia. This is a larger plant with at eight to 12 feet. Um, this is, um, uh, this also has some native eye um, selections, which you can choose for various types of um, beneficial qualities. Abutifolia does tolerate some shade uh, and it provides great fall color. I know um, a friend of mine uses these as planted at the base of a two-story balcony. And these plants, and it's in the shade, it's under high shade from river birch. And these plants have grown up as a kind of a curtain to provide her with some uh, privacy alongside that, that side of her uh, screened in porch. 
and a very, very beautiful plant, very effective, and it does, um, does well in the shade of, of the, dapp the dappled shade of the river birch. The uh, aronia, yeah, okay, so this is a plant that we don't see enough. Um, it would be effective in a, a mass or a shrub border, but they also, particularly the melanocarpa, the, the, um, uh, um, the first one on the left, um, this is particularly can be used as a specimen plant or in a, in a um, mixed, you know, landscape border to provide you with some winter form and substance. Okay, I'm going to stop here before we go to brambles and ask if there are any more questions, Leslie. Yes, there are. <laughs> I'm at a hard okay. time with them. All right. Um, first, somebody asked, is there a reason you didn't cover fig trees? Oh, well, that's not native, are they? Okay, that's what I figured. They are wonderful, wonderful fruit for our urban landscape, and they are one of the few um, fruits that we can grow here to produce a high quality crop. It does not require pesticide sprays. Okay, so it, it is definitely a plant that should be in the landscape and in, in your part of your fruit production cycle. But because this is limited to native plants, it did not get included. Okay. Um, and somebody asked if a pawpaw will still produce fruit if it's kept very small. Um, no, you can train, a, we, we're going to talk about this a little bit at the end, but you can train a pawpaw to, against a wall if you, need, if you have space issues. Um, but I would not think it's going to fruit well unless it's allowed to branch out and to attain its near uh, mature size. Okay. All right. Um, somebody planted two new Duke blueberries, which they said that it quickly shriveled and lost its leaves. They then transplanted them away from a newly installed walk, rock, rock wall with cement. They are wondering, is, it, is there any hope for the dried up plant to come back or should they just get rid of it and start over? Well, I'm guessing here, but that the um, cement wall, that the wall, the soil acidity um, was, uh, was very, very high due to the uh, mortar and the cement type materials that may have been in the soil that, are, in fact, are constantly washing off of the wall. And so it was probably very unhappy in that situation, not only because of the pH of the soil, and I don't know, maybe you didn't, maybe you chucked it, I don't know. But um, the other issue is that stone walls in the landscape tend to hold heat. They act as heat sinks um, when the sun hits it, and that heat is emitted during the daytime. And so there's a good chance that that environment was just not the right place for blueberry and it wanted to have a cooler location. So should, should she start over though or keep try to see if the plant recovers in a better in the new location? This would be a sad time of year to have to transplant a plant <laughs> and so if you can nurse them through until the winter time that's when I would attempt a transplant or even maybe even late late fall you know September October time frame. Okay, um, so somebody had said they were unsuccessful with blueberries and they were wondering if it was because it was too warm, but I think you've covered many other things that, because um, we can be successful with blueberries here, correct? Yeah, the, the most, the biggest, the big, the three biggest things for successful blueberries is soil moisture, keep the soil moist, give it lots of water, make sure the soil with an organic soil that will hold moisture for, you know, but also be well drained, and then the pH level. And the pH level is very key. Okay, and so we did have um, more questions on that. There, somebody asked, how big of a container do you need for the high bush blueberry plant? Oh, good question. I think if you're trying to grow low bush, you could get buy with like a, you know, a 50, either one, I think maybe a, maybe a 17 inch um, type of container, a large um, um, 17 gallon to 25 gallon container would be not too large. Uh, it's also very large for a small landscape. So if you can do a raised bed in part of your landscape, so that these shrubs have soil all the way through to the ground, but you know, so for drainage purposes, but provides a 
um, a rooting medium for the roots to grow into the soil immediately around the plant. You can control that pH in that bed mm -hmm. that's separated from the parent soil much more easily. Okay, and um, follow up to that. Um, somebody wanted to know what type of soil do you put in the pots for that? Oh, well, again, they like a rich organic soil. Um, if you can use a peat-based soil, that will help acidify the soil, provide organic matter, as well as provide the drainage. Um, this is um, the best advice I can give you right there. Okay. Um, and somebody asked, what kind of mulch could, would they use around the top of that? Would fresh sawdust work? Sawdust pine needles will add acidity to the soil and would mimic the, you know, the, the natural environment too. Um, sawdust, you have to be careful with anything you use for mulch. Sawdust particularly, if it's allowed to be mixed with the soil, will result in um, robbing the soil of nitrogen. Uh, if, and so I, I'm not sure I would recommend sawdust, but I do personally use wood chips, deciduous wood chips a lot. Um, for both mulch as well as, you know, working them into the soil once they start to rot because the, um, the cellulose in the wood provides a great deal of food to the microorganisms in the soil and ends up resulting in a very organic, um, um, natural, healthy soil. Okay. Um, and how do you maintain that low pH? By vigilant testing an application of um, products that are recommended through the soil test folks. Sometimes that can be natural sulfur. Um, elemental sulfur provides an acidifying um, action without um, being particularly fast acting. Um, so it's, it's going to maintain and slow down the, uh, you know, slow, you know, maintain a, pH, a low pH without changing it drastically. There is a uh, ammonia sulfate is far better than an aluminum sulfate, which are the other product which was frequently recommended. Aluminum, of course, um, is, uh, you know, can be um, a toxic in the environment. And so uh, if you can limit your choices to either sulfur or um, ammonium sulfate or the natural acidifying effects of leaf mulch and pine needles, that's going to be the way to go. Okay. Um, somebody asked, when do you fertilize fruiting shrubs? Fruiting shrubs need to be fertilized, um, preferably in the winter time, and it, you know, just before they start to grow in the springtime. You may also give them another shot of um, boosting liquid fertilizer in summertime, uh, you know, to kind of boost the nitrogen, especially if they're growing in containers. You're going to have to give them another shot of nitrogen towards the um, uh, midsummer or so. Okay. Is boxwood huckleberry evergreen? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Somebody has two hazelnut bushes that they've had for about seven years, but they've never seen any nuts or noticed them um, fruiting. Are they missing a pollinator plant or why else might they not um, be producing nuts? Um, I'm going to try to advise you to the old extension standby, which is do a soil test, okay? Um, if the phosphorus and potassium levels and micronutrients are not available, you're gonna get very poor flower development and fruit development. If you are applying an overabundance of nitrogen, um, leaf growth and stem growth is gonna be favored to fruit flower production. So that's, that's not gonna help either. Um, Check the varieties. Uh, I want to also, I, I don't remember putting this in the resource list, but I, I will, um, maybe, maybe somebody could put this into the chat box. There is a business called um, Edible Landscape, which is based out of Afton, Virginia. And again, if you have, um, if you're not sure whether or not the varieties that you purchased are what they are, I would contact um, folks that specialize, um, like these folks at, in Afton, Virginia, um, in edible landscape plants to make sure that you're getting the variety that you need. Okay. 
All right, do bugs, let's see. Oh, somebody has elderberries in full sun, but they said the leaves seem to keep burning. Are there any suggestions? Ah, uh, yes, it's probably not getting enough water. Okay. All right, do box huckleberries grow in the wild? Um, somebody is hiking up there in um, upstate New York and wondering if that's what they're seeing. Yes, they do. And that's, uh, you see them there much more often than you'll see them in a cultivated landscape. Okay. Um, somebody had two of each color of currants, red, black, and white, but over the years, the white one has turned red. Is that normal? I'm sorry, what is, what is, what is turned red? Um, they had cur they had currant bushes. They had two of each color, one two white, two red, two black, and they're one. The they said over the years the white one had turned red. Is that normal? I've never heard of that. Okay, I've never heard of that. So um, uh, obviously some form of reversion. It also could be well. I'm not going to speculate. <laughs> Um, that's, that's very unusual. Sometimes you see that kind of uh, change when the um, when the uh, um, a seed drops and that seed germinates and grows up through the other plant and eventually replaces the other plant that may have died or have been replaced gradually. I can't tell you that one. I'm just speculating. Okay. Um, are are aronia deer resistant? Somewhat. Um, the, those those lists that of plants that are deer resistant should not be called deer resistant plants. They should be called some plants that some deer don't eat some of the time. <laughs> um, and so um, there are story legions of stories of people who have planted quote deer resistant plants that find out that they in fact are eaten by deer. And okay. uh, we have a terrible terrible overpopulation of deer in our in our little urban. Uber urban um, Arlington County, and um, obviously there's not a lot for them to eat, so they're going to eat what they can find. All right. Um, somebody asked, why isn't winterberry holly on your shrub list? There are wonderful compact cultivars with per profuse berries. Yes, they are. Do you eat them? These are selections that I have chosen because they provide edible fruit for people. Okay. Not just birds. There you go. Um, is, is, is it okay to um, plant service berry and aronia together? It's, I think because of the rust, um, the rust issue. So those two wouldn't be a problem. Yes, yes, you can plant them together. They, they, um, uh, the alternating host is, is, is um, they're safe from each other. The alternating host is a juniper. Okay. It's a cedar tree, okay, and um, um, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, um, how do you identify wine berry? Ah, well, that's what we're going to do in this very next section. Okay, good. Um, let's see, I need evergreen native shrubs to replace non-native boxwood. What do you recommend? There are lots of choices for that, okay, and it depends on whether or not you're willing to um, want fruit or whether you want to have simply an ornamental evergreen um, and so that I, I'm going to refer that question to the help desk. Okay. Um, would the same tips for blueberries be applicable for honeyberries? Honeyberries? Yes. I don't, I don't, not sure what we're referring to by honeyberries. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. All right. Um, let's go on for fruiting brambles and we'll come back to any other questions. <laughs> Okay, um, so the picture on this page is of non-native wineberry, which is um, a highly invasive plant that has taken off in our woods. Nevertheless, it is somewhat popular amongst people who are foraging for fruit in our woods. Uh, it is a rubus, which means that it is related to all of these others, which are not uh, invasive and are in fact native. But the wineberry is not native, but it has lovely fruit to eat. So um, if you're lucky enough to find it, I'm torn between telling you, pull it out and discard it. But that's what we really should do. Okay, and, and plant some of these others that are native and produce wonderful, wonderful fruit. Let's start with black raspberry. Um, this is a very uh, popular edible. Um, it will go to six feet. It has an arching habit. 
Um, you will find this in the, in the wild, along roadsides, along the edges of woods, disturbed areas, um, fields that are going to, you know, going through um, transition to woods. You're going to find it in places that have moist soils. It's not going to thrive for long in areas that are dry, and you're not going to find this plant in the shade. You could have it in the home garden. There are many, many, many cultivars of this plant which are available to you um, to use for, that are improved varieties that you can use at home in your landscape. One of the problems with this plant is that it's a little bit ungainly in the home landscape and can take up a lot of room. Notice in the picture on the right the kind of purplish color to the canes. This is a wintertime look. Um, and this is very characteristic of raspberries. The flowers all look the same in rubus, but this purple cane is interestingly unique to raspberries. When you pull a raspberry off of the, the picket, the raspberry comes off of a central core. And this is how you tell, and, and the berry itself, um, the fruit itself, which is an aggregate, of fruit actually, um, has a hollow core to it. And this is very, very different from the blackberry. When you pick a blackberry, um, which at least on the surface looks very similar, you will not have a hollow core. The core actually comes off with the berry and you would consume it along with the rest of the aggregate fruit. Uh, this is a fruit, blackberry, which grows along woods edges. You'll see it in old pastures. It absolutely requires full sun. And it's going to get to three to six feet. It spreads vegetatively in thickets, just like the raspberry does, and it fruits on two-year-old canes. And I want to talk about that fruiting on two-year-old canes because that has implications for you as when you manage this in the landscape, okay? The first year that this sprouts out, it sends up a green um, vegetative cane. Right? Those canes are going to be the canes that produce fruit in the following year. Okay, so the two-year-old canes are what fruits. In the third year, that cane, that two-year-old cane that produced fruit, will continue to produce fruit, but it will not be as productive as the two-year-old canes. So normal management for, in, in, for production of berries involves, if you can be bothered with it, uh, involves removing those old canes. Remove the three-year-old canes in favor of the one and two-year-old canes so that you have a continuing production of renewal of one and two-year-old canes in your landscape. Um, like raspberries, um, this can be tapped, topped back to about four feet so that you have, so it doesn't overwhelm your entire landscape. But um, when I was a kid, we had a, um, a big pasture behind our house and my father would hand us, each of us three kids, a two quart pitcher and we were told to go out and pick it until it was full. So we dusted up our legs to prevent triggers and went out and picked berries. And we had wonderful, wonderful desserts made in jam and pastries made from this, um, these blackberries. So home landscape, prune them back, um, restrain them somehow so they don't take over your entire property. Encourage the suckers that do come out um, that will become your one-year-old canes uh, and remove those three-year-old canes so you continuously have food production. I've included northern dewberry, again, because it is a very um, diminutive plant. It tends to be horizontal as opposed to vertical. Um, with the raspberry and blackberry, these are vertical arching plants. The dewberry, which then the fruit is very, very similar to blackberry, same thing, um, but a little bit smaller, um, is more horizontal. And what's interesting about it is that the rootstock, like blackberry, is perennial, okay? The rootstock will continue to produce new growth every year. But the stems that are produced from that rootstock are only biennial. The two-year-old stems, after they fruit in the second year, those stems will die, okay? And so you have to continuously be removing that and encouraging the one and two-year-old um, 
cocoons to come out, the stems. This is a plant that will tolerate some shade and it's often found on the wood's edge where it gets those kinds of conditions. Um, it, uh, in the native habitat, it often is shared with poison ivy. But this is a fabulous plant, not only for butterflies that feed on the fruit, um, but for many, many wild animals um, like the raspberries and blackberries also do that provide, that depend on this for food source, birds, butterflies, and so on. Okay, we're gonna move on through here for fruit, fruiting vines. Um, this is grape and passion flower. And um, grapes, um, again, support a wide variety of birds and, and pollinators and should be encouraged. And I've included passion flower only because it's native and it is kind of cool. There are four species of, in Arlington. There are 11 in Virginia of native grape varieties that do well here. It is a vine. It will grow up to the top of your trees if, you, if it's allowed to do that, um, but it does not harm trees. It has co-evolved with the trees to provide um, support for itself while sheltering the tree in somewhat and providing some shade there too. Um, it is unlike one of the major invasives in this regard that we're talking about next, but this is an extremely valuable uh, fruit crop for birds, for butterflies, and for many mammals that eat the fruit. It is often confused with porcelain berry. And porcelain berry is a major horrific invasive plant in our area, um, which um, is often, not only is, is porcelain berry often mistaken for grape and allowed to remain, many times grape is removed by people thinking that it is porcelain berry. Here's how you tell the difference. The grape is going to have peeling bark on the stems, on the older stems, you know, pieces that fall away. The birds use that peeling bark to build nests and so on. Um, if you cut a grape stem in, in a crossways, um, you will see that the center of it is brown. And if you cut a porcelain berry stem in cross section, you will see that the pith, the very center of the stem is white. Uh, the other way you can tell the difference is that the porcelain berry has something called lentils on the stems, which look like little vertical um, um, freckles on the stem of the um, plant, um, which is very different from the grape, which is going to have a more plain and even um, peeling bark as it gets older. If you have concerns about whether a plant is um, porcelain berry or grape, um, do do get expert help before removing it because the grape does provide very valuable um, services to our wildlife. Purple passion flower, purple passion flower um, is also called maypop. And maypop um, gets its name from the fruit, which is down in the lower right corner, which is about the size of sometimes as big as a, as a ping pong ball and smaller. But um, the maypop is essentially hollow when it's ripe, and this is a, a, a fruit that is used for juices and so on, uh, many different uses for it. But it's a very cool flower and a very primitive looking flower with all the parts of it very clearly separated. Uh, it is a major um, um, support plant for various bees, moths, bats, hummingbirds, various butterflies, and so on. And as is many times the case, this is a plant that often appears on weed lists, on most wanted weed problem lists. Um, so it does recede prolifically and you can find, you, if it, becomes a pro, it may become a problem if you plant this in the landscape, if you allow it to go to seed. One easy way to stop plants from becoming uh, weed problems is to remove the fruit and um, seeds before they are allowed to uh, fall on the ground. But as it gets to 25 feet, you often see it on fence rows and um, it will grow horizontally if allowed. Okay, um, Leslie, are there any more questions we can answer before you go into this next section? Yes, there are. Okay. All right. Um, so somebody wanted to explain that honeyberries are um, also known as hasberry, a relative of the honeysuckle. Does that ring a bell? Still 
Um, yes, it does. Um, and I don't know how, I don't know anything about the cultivation of them. Okay. Are there um, any do it yourself soil test kits so they don't have to send them away? Well, that's a good question. You can, you can buy a pH meter. You can, you, I, 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 I've not heard wonderful stories about how effective they are, uh, but you can buy a pH meter, which is inserted in the soil and ostensibly um, tells you what the pH of the soil is. Um, this soil test kit that you do send away, the, the basic cost is um, $10 for um, uh, Virginia residents, and um, it's going to tell you a lot more than the pH. It's going to tell you the pH. It's also going to tell you the major and minor nutrients. And if you specify the crop, you notice on this sample right here, I don't know whether you can read it or not, but it says vegetable gardens on the sample. This is a particular sample from somebody that submitted a, uh, a request for assistance with amending soil for ideal growing conditions for vegetable gardens, okay? And notice that there's a pH measurement on the left. Then there's, it tells you whether the nutrients are sufficient or insufficient for the ideal growth of those particular plants. And at the bottom section, it makes lime and other fertilizer recommendations for your crop. So this gives you a lot more information that's very useful. And I do, you don't have to do this every year, um, but every two or three years, I would highly recommend that you do this. Or if you've never done it before, do it and see what kind of information you get from it. And the really nice thing about the soil test that Virginia Tech provides is that I have access to these uh, results as well. And if you have ever had a question about the interpretation of the soil test results, you can contact the help desk and we can find um, time to help you walk you through the recommendations. Okay. Um, are aronias prone to powdery mildew? Uh, um, I have seen powdery mildew on aronia. I don't know it to be a major problem on them. Um, powdery mildew, of course, is a fungal disease which is opportunistic. You know, when we have if you have the conditions that are favorable and you have a plant that's susceptible, you're going to have disease expression on your plants um, because the fungal pathogens are in the air we breathe, okay? So, um, I, no, I don't know them to be particularly susceptible. Okay. Um, somebody had planted thornless blackberries and they said they're spreading like wildflower uh, or wildfire through their, their area. How do you control that while still being able to enjoy the fruit? Well, you're going to have to stop the spread of the underground stolons um, by um, restraining them somehow. And one way you might find is to plant them alongside a fence or other kind of structure or a trellis and put down um, a barrier, a root barrier on either side of the plant so that they are, so that the roots when they hit that will come up along that barrier and um, not be allowed to spread out through the entire landscape. And that's the best way I can do this. Essentially, you're creating the sides of a container in the ground. Right, okay. Um, somebody asked, why are the raspberry fruits so small? Well, that's a good question. And I think one of the answers is that it may not be getting enough water. Um, the, the water needs of plants vary um, and just because it's native doesn't mean that they are going to not need water, supplemental water. Um, the standard recommendation for optimizing plant health is one inch of water per week. And uh, if we can go here for weeks and weeks without having one inch of water coming out of the sky. So you're going to have to um, add water irrigation, particularly when the fruit is forming. Okay. Um, somebody has black raspberries. Let's see. Uh, when do you chop down um, the canes for black raspberry? In the winter time, pre-spring? What What's the right time for that? I think the optimal time is going to be that um, you cut them down at the end of the year, so that you remove and clean up the bed of plants. Um, barring that, you can remove them in the following spring, but I would definitely do it before the new growth starts. 
okay? Once a new growth starts, you've got a lot more um, plants coming up that are subject to damage from your feet and from your pruning tools. And um, kind of to continue on with that, um, somebody said, after several years of blackberries, how, do you, how can you tell which canes are the three-year-old canes so that you're not accidentally cutting the um, one-year-old or two-year-old canes? Um, well, you're going to have to observe them a little bit. Um, typically, the, the one-year-old cane is going to be greener. You know, you're going to have green growth, new growth. Um, the two-year-old cane is going to also be green tending the brown and the three-year-old cane is going to be the most brown. Um, and so if you're not sure, <laughs> you can cut them down to the ground and start over again. And that's kind of a, something that somebody, some people recommend actually um, for, for, and you're going to miss it. You're going to miss a whole year of fruit that way. Right. Okay. Um, somebody has an area in their backyard where wine berry that they did not plant is, you know, just kind of growing wild itself. Um, they were, is it okay to just leave it be, or is it bad enough for the environment that you would recommend pulling it? It's not, it's in the back where, you know, it's not bothering them. They don't really see it, but they don't want to be causing a problem. As somebody who likes to eat wine berry, I have to say, can you get the fruit before the birds do? Because if you can get the fruit before the birds do, it's not going to get spread around. Um, and, and I'm really kind of tongue-in-cheek serious about that, okay? Um, but strictly speaking, I have to say that it's better for you to plant a cultivated variety or raspberry or blackberry as a replacement and throw the, the um, wineberry away. Okay. Um, can blackberry and um, north dewberry be trained onto trellises or wires to save space? Um, absolutely. Um, and that's often done in pick your own operation. Not the, not the um, yeah, the dewberry. Some of the dewberries, um, the taller dewberries, can, you can do that too. Um, typically it's done on a two wire, uh, a fence with, with posts with, with, with a, a, a wire or two running between them. And the berries are planted underneath that wire and they're not allowed to spread too far outside of that planting zone. And the, um, the canes themselves are lashed and or fastened to the wires um, so they don't arch over the top and take up too much space. Okay. Um, when do you prune back blackberries and are the native type the ones with thorns? The thornless blackberries are, the native ones do have thorns. Okay. All right. There may be some cultivars, however, that are thornless that you, you know, if that bothers you, you can do that. Okay. Um, is, does passion fruit plant survive over the winter? Um, I believe it does. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I know it recedes prolifically. Um, and so I think you, if you have passion flower, you're always going to have passion flower. And somebody asked, does that make a good container plant? I've never seen it grown in a container, but I don't see why not. And many people grow it on trellises as part of, and it looks beautiful when you combine it with roses or clematis on a, uh, on a climbing, climbing frame. Okay. And then we had a couple of people who were asking, what did you do to prevent chiggers? It's something about powdered ah. eggs. <laughs> um, Powdered elemental sulfur, the same stuff I recommended for putting in your ground to acidify the soil, is a, an insect repellent. Uh, we used to have this elemental sulfur, this powdered sulfur, uh, and we put it in an old sock. And we would take that sock filled with this powdery stuff and we would, you know, dust our shoes and socks and pant legs and, and legs too um, with this material. And that was, that was very effective. Okay. All right. I think we can um, finish up and we'll catch any more questions at the end. Okay. All right. So I want to just finish up here with some thoughts on how do you use these plants in the landscape. And um, it, it, it's helpful when you are designing a landscape to think about uh, the various elements on the sections of it, um, to think of your landscape as having floors, walls, and ceilings perhaps, you know. Um, here's a picture by, by Master Gardener Mary Free um, that points out the fact that the pollinators and uh, wild animals will benefit from these plants at every level of the landscape, everywhere from ground cover all the way up to the canopy level. 
And so when you're looking at your landscape, especially if you have a little more room to play with, um, you can think about it in these terms, you know, what can you plant for ground cover, you know, that's going to be um, um, maybe not necessarily fruit producing, but will, sort of will be native, okay? Um, can you have um, some of the medium forbs, and forbs is a word for herbaceous plants, okay? Um, ostrich fern uh, are going to provide fiddleheads that you can eat. Um, lamb's quarters is a well-known um, wild edible bee balm and so on. Um, tall forbs, uh, again, herbaceous plants that are going to provide you with some, some taller herbaceous plant backgrounds that you can mix in with shrubs. Um, Jerusalem artichoke, echinacea, asparagus. These are all going to be examples of plants that kind of fill the landscape and provide you with some um, native plant benefits. Shrubs, aronia, blueberry, and elderberry. Again, if you can mix those in with your forbs, it makes a very effective multi-layered landscape, especially when you add the trees to it. And the small trees, the understory um, trees that perform the edges of the, of the woods, as well as the overstory trees are going to be the plant that you need to su you know, supply shelter and food to birds, um, wildlife, the nut trees. It's not just food for us, it's food for the animals as well. So this is multi-purpose, multi-function landscaping. Um, I want to also give you some thoughts on space saving. I know we touched on some of this already. Um, Growing blueberries, for instance, in containers is a very effective way of managing the pH. This is something you can do um, to, to provide more flexibility in your landscape. You can put a container, for instance, on top of a paved surface. Use your trellises to add vertical elements to your landscape and get the plants off the ground. Many of the plants that need full sun can very effectively be grown on trellises with the shade loving things underneath it. Um, fences and walls provide you a way to aspire um, plants like figs and apples and other kinds of woody plants against in a two-dimensional um, layout as opposed to a three-dimensional space um, hogging uh, form. The picture on the lower left is of something called cordon training. And cordon training is a way of training fruits to a single stem. And the single stem is often laid um, um, diagonally to be able to maximize the amount of, of green leaf production at the top. Um, it's a very, very labor, and both of that and espalier are very labor intensive uh, fruit production methods. Um, the bottom right is, is a picture of a, of a two or three, three um, line uh, espalier style. So think about using your fruit trees as a replacement for fencing or as a, as a means of separating parts of your landscape too. Um, you don't have to grow it like a tree. You can grow it in a, in a form like this where you can have it actually perform a function in the landscape. And of course, there are many dwarf cultivars, not only of our favorite fruit plants, but also some of the native plants that will um, fit into your landscape. Um, the low mound aronia, for instance, is a very low um, two, two foot plant that will fit into anybody's garden. Um, what's Arlington doing? The, I want to give a shout out to a, a group that is emerging as a very effective leaders in our community, the Friends of Urban Agriculture, um, which is um, working hard on this Victory Gardens project. They are also um, researching experiences of other communities and exploring um, the, the promotion of fruit producing landscape plants in our public parks. And so I, I, I really think it's a wonderful effort that's going on. And the county is, uh, county designers and, 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 and natural resource managers are very receptive to this because this is supporting our wildlife and our plants. Finally, what can we do better? Um, this is the, on the left side, this is the calorie pear, the, the Bradford pear that have uh, become, were planted so enthusiastically that now have escaped cultivation and have become a terrible, terrible invasive plant in our landscape. Um, what can we do with those? Well, you can take those and change them into an edible fruit simply by grafting on a scion of edible fruit on top of the um, Bradford pear rootstock. 
And this is often even done commercially. This is not gorilla, totally gorilla gardening, okay? But you can harvest um, cyan wood from um, um, European pears um, and, and uh, you know, graft them onto the, um, the, the rootstock of Bradford pears in various different techniques that include, you know, um, splice grafts, um, veneer grafts, and whip and tongue grafts. And I would be happy to talk to anybody about a workshop on doing this kind of thing um, because it's, it's a fun, fun thing to do. And grafting um, pieces of other plants onto, onto the crop that you really want is a time-honored way of producing, a, providing a pollinizer for that crop. This is done in apples, for instance, where they will graft a scion of crab apple onto the end of an apple tree branch to attract the, um, to the, the not only to, to attract the bees, but also to um, provide a different um, cross pollination pollinizer for that crop tree. Sorry for that little teaser there, okay? Um, but we will be recording, this will be available again. Um, if you have a favorite, um, those of you who got the resources, if you have a favorite and you would like to add something to that list for everybody's enjoyment, uh, please do so. If you have a search, uh, search if you wish to do a, a search, what we promote is the use of site colon edu sources. Uh, in Google, you can use, type any topic in. It might be aronia cultivars, okay? You could type aronia cultivars, then the word site, S-I-T-E-U, S-I-T-E, colon E-D-U, and you will get only sources that are dot E-D-U, research-based institution information. Finally, I want to give a shout out to the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website and the organization that have provided fabulous um, teaching tools for the public. Um, this is, uh, they have a, under the plants tab on that website, there's the tried and true plant, native plants, as well as best bets. These don't focus on edible plants, but they do focus on native plants. And if you are looking for some ideas, this is a really great place to start in addition to the many resources that I put onto the resources tab. Um, also on mgnv.org, there is a list of uh, upcoming public education on the calendar, as well as a virtual library of pre-recorded presentations, which you can access for free. So do take advantage of this important resource. And of course, remember that um, I'm always there for you. Um, there is a, um, um, an email address down there below. The Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia uh, uh, have a website that you can, you can have amazing, amazing resources there. Um, and of course, um, the help desk, which we've talked about several times today, is the email is up there um, for you to send them questions, send them pictures, um, ask whatever you need to ask. So I want to thank you again for coming today. And um, um, I'm, I, we've gone over a few minutes, but um, appreciate your patience and your, many of your questions. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna, uh, for those who care to stick around, um, we will uh, finish up our questions. And I did put a, a list of upcoming classes into the chat box so folks can um, know what's coming up on our, our upcoming Fridays. All right, um, Kirsten, somebody asked, do you, how do you layer and avoid obstructing sun in small, in very small places? Avoid obstructing sun? Yeah. Um, well, um, in some cases you can't avoid obstructing the sun. You know, you have either the building or you have adjacent trees, your neighbors have trees. And so um, one of the important things that we do when we do site analysis is to assess how much light you actually have. Um, go out there at different times of the day and mark where you have light and where you have sun and you will get an idea of whether you have two hours of light a day or 10 hours of light a day. Um, you can make a decision making about what kind of plant selection you have available based on the amount of light that you know that you have. Okay. Um, somebody had just commented that they would love to see some classes on um, the two slides that you had up there on um, designing in layers and space saving techniques. So that's something we can consider for an upcoming um, public ed education session. Okay. Um, can high bush blueberry be grown on the northeast side of a house? Yes. Okay. That might be the optimal place to put it. Okay. 
because it's um, getting some shade, um, but the key ingredient there is gonna be the soil acidity and the soil moisture levels. So um, significant uh, improvement of the soil is probably in order. And with blueberries, I'm gonna make the exception to say that if you're serious about your blueberries, you're going to want to um, do an annual soil test until you get the right mix and the right mix of soil that will stay acid enough to support blueberry growth. Okay, um, somebody asked, where can you currently get soil test kits? Ah, very good question. I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> um, um, Fairlington Community Center, where we would normally operate out of, is still closed. The soil test kits are being stocked at two locations. One of them is Green Street Garden Center at the corners of Quaker Lane and Braddock Road in Alexandria. Um, the other location is in a box, uh, which is affixed to the gate that goes to the back um, garden at Fairlington Community Center. And there is a driveway that comes back to the service area and the loading dock um, that comes off of Utah Street behind the building. And you can come up there and you can get a soil test kit, which is uh, hanging on in a box on the gate. So if you're standing on the field looking at the back of the building, it's to the right, um, the fence on the right back there. Okay, and somebody has a, a new service berry um, that it's, they're wondering is, is it okay if it's growing almost directly in lawn? They kind of pulled out about a one to two foot diameter around it, but will the grass, if it's, do they need to make that larger? Will the grass hurt the service berry? Um, the answer to your question is it depends. It depends. Um, the service berry will appreciate not receiving um, the, the types of fertilizer and, and herbicides and other kinds of chemicals that are typically applied to a lawn. Um, and so it, it won't, it's not going to die, but it will be much happier if you are maintaining your lawn in an organic fashion um, and um, leaving at least a two foot um, tree circle that's mulched will help prevent weeds and damage to the trunk of the tree. Okay, and for our last question, um, somebody asked if you can use compost of citrus peels to help with acidity for blueberries or should it be sulfur based? Uh, well, citrus, citrus peels and so on are typically not, um, uh, not recommended to be put into compost piles. That's not the question actually, but um, I would not use citrus fruit or shredded citrus fruit or anything like that to acidify the soil. Um, you're far better off using um, um, the, the elemental sulfur or the, the um, uh, ammonia sulfate products that are available to you to acidify the